On this episode of The Eternities, the author Simon G. Powell. The average human psyche might not think about these issues, these global issues and our relationship to the, the web of life. Through psychedelics, that might well, they might well confront all this and they, have, they might well have all these profound thoughts about themselves, the role of the, the meaning of life and what the human race should be doing. You know, you can have a very normal, regular person who never thinks about those things and suddenly their, their, their life has changed and then suddenly they're, you know, um, they see things totally differently and they're, they're much more sensitive to these larger contexts within which, which we live. Something for your mind, your body and your soul. Simon G. Powell is a musician, filmmaker, and author of two books, The Psilocybin Solution and Darwin's Unfinished Business. He was recently a speaker on the subject of the natural intelligence paradigm at the annual International Bioethics Forum in the U.S. I started the interview by asking about the self-described mushroom fever he experienced in his youth, which seems to have initiated his work. Mushroom, yeah, well, no, not simply mushroom fever, but uh, that was exacerbated by chronic biophilia, a very serious disease. Um, what do you mean by biophilia? Well, not chronic biophilia. Well, bi biophilia was a term coined by E.O. Wilson, um, referring to our innate love of nature. So, our, you know, we, we find bird song attractive and the sound of rivers and the, the way mountains look and the sky so it's a it's an inherent love of nature because we evolved in uh, nature um, and of course now we have a nature deficit disorder um, so we've got that biophilia is kind of because we live in cities is uh it's buried i guess um so we have this nature deficit disorder so biophilia is a good thing but i had chronic biophilia which uh, the mushroom can um cause where you you just fall in love with uh with the biosphere basically it takes on a kind of a goddess uh quality um but yeah i mean it's tongue-in-cheek chronic biophilia although some people you know i have had people write to me and say oh this uh, this chronic biophilia sounds really bad i know you could take this herb and then you'd be fine you know so this british humor doesn't go down well no. uh, so you, so you didn't see it as negative then no, 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 this is it's British humour. Uh, and the same with the mushroom fever as well. Um, it's just my... But I did... The mushroom fever, there was, there was a three-month period of time in uh, 1992 where I did the mushroom. I was consuming it uh, maybe twice a week for about three months. And uh, I got very uh, inspired. I felt like I was the luckiest man in the world at the time. And I was reading Terence McKenna and The Shaman. The Shaman were in the charts, and uh, I later got to know Colin Angus of the band. Um... So yeah, mushroom fever, chronic biophilia. These are these are the dangers of uh, of psilocybin, but uh, they're um, they're benign <laughs> dangers, really. You know. So where were you on the scale of biophilia before you took mushroom? Oh well, that's interesting because I've always I've always had an interest in um, the natural world. You know, I'm a, I grew up in North Devon, Devon, so I'm a country boy at heart, um, and I go. You know, I like trekking I, I like nature i like being in nature it's my favorite pastime i think uh trekking and walking up and down mountains and you know walking through forests and things so um it was always there and the, the, i think the mushroom if you're that if you i think the mushroom psilocybin suit particularly if you take it outdoors in sort of wilderness areas um if you have a love of nature that will that will really come out and i think it's i think that's the, the in my, from my, ex see, you got to remember Terence McKenna back in, you know, Terence McKenna was a psilocybin guru back in the late eighties and and all through the nineties, and he would always advise people to to take the mushroom 
indoors in darkness, you unplug all the phones, make sure you're not disturbed, shut your eyes for visions and such. And that's that. That's good, sensible uh, advice. But there is another. You can also take the mushroom in in the places where you where you, where you pick them, and I, I, they can be readily picked all over the Lake District, all over Snowdonia, all over Dartmoor. And if you camp out in those areas and take the mushroom around a campfire or whatever, then um, that's actually just as good as taking it in, indoors with all the lights off and everything. It's a whole new kind of ball game, and it, it stimulates this biophilia. If you ever want to know what what maximum biophilia feels like, then take the mushroom out in wilderness, and, um, yeah, you, you get to really commune with the with the biosphere and the the web of life and it's a it's a tremendous thing so so before you you know you figured out all these conceptions and you sort of went deeper and studied um yeah the psilocybin itself and, and everything that, that that then led on to what was was it like a, a revelation you know that your very first experience what what exactly was it like and you know how, how did it change you you know it, it, you know in that initial sort of first raw experience well I I have I have a new book actually coming out in January called uh, Mush- Magic Mushroom Explorer Psilocybin and the Awakening Earth and that is all about my own personal journey because the other psilocybin book I wrote the psilocybin solution is quite dry it's, it's fairly academic and there's not much personal experience in there I, mean, I talk about other people's experiences but I uh, only touch on my own sort of journey whereas this new book that's coming out that is very personal it's all about my journey so you're asked so i've written about in the, that book or how it all started it, it goes right back to the 1980s and actually the first I, i'd spent a few years searching for the psilocybe semilanciata the liberty cap it took me a few years before i f- finally fa- found them um that grows in the uk Oh, yeah, it's very yeah. common, but it took me – you have to be at the right time at the, in the right place. Uh, and I, So I looked – over two, two years I'd looked, or during the autumn of two years. And I finally found them in, in Richmond Park, actually, in London. Um, this was the late 80s, about 1986, I think. Um, and it totally – I was a lot younger, a very young, naive man – um, and there was less information about that. And, you know, he didn't have the internet. Um, and it, when the experience started, it totally took me by surprise. And it, it started off, it was very negative. And I had like a, it began as a classic bad trip. And I experienced the chaos that was my unconscious or my the deeper parts of my psyche. And it was very frightening to, to be exposed to all that kind of chaos. Um, but I'd recently been studying Gurdjieff, um, and Gurdjieff, like a lot of spiritual gurus, uh, taught self-knowledge, and I'd been exposed to these ideas of self-knowledge and basically mindfulness, the ability to see what's going on in your own psyche. And so this bad, it started off terrible. I thought I was going mad, and it was just like a... It's like hearing a thousand bickering voices in my mind. It was awful. And I thought, man, I've been searching (laughs) for two years for this substance, and it's horrible. Um, And it was really frightening. But then I I was able to impartially observe this inner chaos. And the closer I observed it, the more clearly I saw it, the more I kind of separated my self from it and i was able to rise above it and then the whole and this is all thanks to gurdjieff to following his teachings uh, it highlights the importance of uh, spiritual traditions that teach mindfulness and then it went from a horrible this horrible experience to absolute bliss and i had a a mystical experience and i, I, was, I still remember it was late at night and i was lying in bed and i could just feel this what felt like divine energy pulsing through me and it was absolutely fantastic and, it, and that changed uh, I, I think that changed the, I taste in the, as I say in the book um, it was like I ex- tasted something that <clears throat> most people don't taste and it was absolutely astonishing and um, had a big impact and it made me interested in it made me more interested in higher states of consciousness once you've seen these that these are you once you've seen directly that there that these other 
higher states of consciousness exist and you've tasted them and you know you know they're real um that led to this life you know i'm still i'm still writing about psilocybin now you know 25 years on or whatever so um yeah so that's how but it started scarily you know it was complete opposite of fantastic there there can be a naive attitude people think oh it's all easy and it's not It, it will never if you've never had a psychedelic before it's not it's, you cannot imagine it, what it is, what, what the experience is, until you you actually there experiencing it, and it can be really scary. You know, it's, to, it's the, the psychedelic means mind manifesting, and I think I have a very Jungian approach to it. It's it's the unconscious, and the unconscious is vast, and there are areas there we don't that we're not familiar with, and when that suddenly becomes apparent, and you see what's there, it can be quite. Uh, frightening so it's very important to be educated about and, uh, and to approach these these substances like psilocybin or ayahuasca with uh, respect and um you know some trepidation and and, and realize that they're very powerful and they can be very life-changing but um it, not always so easy you know it can be quite um challenging the experience so how do these experiences continue to um fuel and inspire your work um do you, do you feel that these early experiences or this mushroom fever as you called it kind of literally changed you at some kind of deeper level or is it just purely the sort of glow of of the memory of these amazing experiences that that pushes you on what what, has anything sort of fundamentally happened to you from these experiences and and can other people get there too do you think well i can't speak for other people i can only speak for Mm. myself if they affect everyone differently and um, they just bring out your essence i think um i well i've never i don't i don't take I only take them now. I'm middle aged now. I take them to maybe two or three times. Take psilocybin two or three times a year. Usually during autumn, I trek. Normally go trekking with a close friend, and we we pick them and take them out around a fire um, in either the Lake District or Snowdonia, or these wilderness areas. Um, and so I'm still on that track. Um, I, and I've the last I don't know the last. I don't know, my main my main thing these days is this natural intelligence paradigm. I'm, I'm interested in reinterpreting uh, how we view life on Earth, and so the I'm try, what I'm trying to do. I think it's incumbent if you explore these substances. It's all very well having you know mystical experiences and experiencing bliss and, and stuff, and, and having these remarkable altered states of consciousness. But you really have to try and bring something. McKenna always used to try say this. You really have. You really have to try and bring some vision back and try and integrate it into normal, that's with inverted commas, um, our normal world, our normal culture. And um, that's what I've tried I've tried to do with my, my films and uh, the second book I wrote, Darwin's Unfinished Business, The Self-Organizing Intelligence of Nature. It's about trying to... to, to I, I currently promote this new paradigm uh, in which one can view the web of life as as a kind of intelligence and that we can learn from that intelligence there's a wisdom to life on earth and we need to learn that wisdom so there it, so i so i think my whole it, it evolves you know you, you the journey continues and it, it maybe it changes and you i'm not as naive as i was back in my mushroom fever period of, of 92 i think i was a quite naive you, you there's a tendency to become very quixotic and you want to tell everyone and shout to everyone about these experiences you've had of course people want to understand you they just think you you know you're off your head or whatever um so you have to be you know with years and experience you become more more mature i guess and you you can you you you're careful about how you say things and the way you say things and um but yeah the the, the effect i'm still on that I'm still the the particularly the mushroom fever period of 1992. Uh, I had many mystical experiences at the time, and I'm still being pre- the, there was like an impulse was initiated then, and I'm still being carried on on that impulse, you know. And so it's still going. It's not. It's never the journey never ends. I don't think it's a, it's a, like a it's like a big mystery that you're exploring, and you find these ways. Um, or you find these clues, it's like a maze, you know, and you find clues along the way. Um, and you just, you just keep going, you know. So now, now this mission, do you think that what you're doing in, in terms of losing your naivety is to, to try and 
tell you know to sing to sing the good news if you want to call, you know use the old sort of um christian sort of way of looking at it too but 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 in the in the terminology of science and, and mass communications writing books and so on is, is that is that what you do and you you still want you still want to sort of you know tell everybody about this but yeah in, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, yeah evangelical praise yeah. the lord yeah. praise the biosphere um yeah it's uh um, my, well, my, 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 my instinct has always been that there's something to the experience, the psilocybin experience. You know, that's why they were considered, the mushroom was considered sacred by native cultures. There's any number of reports of people having life-changing experience, experiences. So there's something to be said for these higher states of consciousness and these, that what feel like insights into the, the essence of existence, if you like, that they are, maybe they are insights. And so there's, you, if it, so if there's truth to it all, it needs to, it, it will surely gel with what science tells us about the universe and what science tells us about consciousness and all this kind of thing. So, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm trying to, all like, like my Darwin's unfinished business book, I didn't, Men, you know, that's 90,000 words. I didn't mention psilocybin at all in that. So people would could read that and never, maybe never guess that the, the inspiration behind it was primarily the, the mushroom. So you, you can, you know, you can, yeah, you can mo move on and expand and, um, you know, like I say, try and integrate certain insights into our normal way of, of conceiving of the world, you know, to try and integrate new concepts, new perspectives, new perspectives and new um, uh, paradigms in, into, into culture. I guess that's what I'm interested in doing. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I've, I'm still inspired to do that and that's what I, I will keep trying to do, particularly, particularly this thing about how we view life on Earth because we, you know, the, the big, I'd say that one of the biggest crises afflicting the species at the moment is our unhealthy relationship with the rest of the web of life and um, undoubtedly ayahuasca and psilocybin have an eco psychological they can potentially have an eco psychological impact and people be can become much more in tune with the natural world and that's so that's an important thing so um in the day and age in which we live i think it's uh the, this eco psychological impact is very um, germane and important. Well, I wanted to get into that in a minute, but but before we move away from uh, the mushroom, um, just interested if you had a sort of uh, a response to you know the skeptics that never took psychedelics or maybe took it once or twice and they just d dismiss the effects as um, drug induced hallucinations. Have you, have you got a, a response to that? Well, yeah, I mean you you. Yeah, um, I don't know what to say to, say to that, really. Um, it's a very well, sad. Can, it's a very sad sort of critique that well, we've no, heard no, many times. No, no, I, I think it's it's all it's all grist for the mill. It's all um, worthy, you know. And I, the, there's always some points of interest there, because I mean, well, well, first the first thing I'd say was is in my naive young, younger years, I always assumed everyone would have a similar experience to me if they took the mushroom, and I now know that's not true. You know, I. I I had this biophilia thing and I got into this natural intelligence paradigm and this interest in life because I've always been interested in biology. If someone's never been, interest, been interested in animals and plants and the biosphere, then they might, you know, there might be no biophilia. So it is, it can be a very subjective experience. Um, so people are not guaranteed to become ecologically aware when they take, uh, there are no guarantees there if they take ayahuasca or psilocybin that they'll suddenly become eco inspired you know um but as as to the the notion that um it's just drugs it's just chemical well yeah it is a chemical sure it's a chemical you t you you chemically alter your basically your cortex um and psilocybin for for example uh, it mimics serotonin which is a um a common uh one of the main neurotransmitters in, in the human cortex so psilocybin mimic mimic and dmt as well they mimic serotonin they sort of infiltrate the chemical systems of the brain they change the way information is being processed and hence you have a different experience your your consciousness is changed but to say it's merely 
That's all it is. It's just, well, you could say that about anything. I could say if a reductionist says, oh, these mystical experiences are nothing but, uh, uh, you know, chemical changes in the brain, I could say that about reductionism. I could say that, well, that reductionistic view is simply this area of the brain behaving in this way. Or if you're deeply in love, you can say, well, it might feel brilliant, but it's simply this part of the brain. Or if you climb to the top of Mount Everest and you're at the top of Mount Everest and you're having this fantastic experience up there, you know, reductionists can say, well, it's simply this area of the brain, which is now, you know, you can't, at the end of the day, all we know is our conscious experience. And so there's this phrase that perception is reality, yeah? Have you heard that phrase, perception is reality? Because perception is reality. All we know is our conscious experience. Even when people are, physicists are talking about Higgs bosons or something, that's an idea within consciousness. There is, consciousness is fundamental, so it cannot be um, brushed aside. So when when you get these uh, classic objections that it's just chemicals in the brain or whatever, well, all our consciousness is is connected to chemistry as far as we know so it's not really a it's not a fatal criticism it's just a, some kind of uh often it comes from from scientists who are probably a, too afraid to, to make the experiment themselves you know like richard dawkins has never had a psychedelic experience yet and i think people i would encourage all scientists to uh, i would encourage any scientist or artist or any person who's interested in Who's in, who, who can see that consciousness is interesting and who can see that consciousness is fundamental and who can see that consciousness is mutable and it varies, I would, I would recommend all of those people, anyone with that, with that sort of interest, that they should look into psilocybin and ayahuasca because it's so, the experience is so profound and you have to be, you have to have the experience to know it. You have to, Gurdjieff used to say, Al Spensky, uh, one of Gurdjieff's main pupils once once asked uh, Gurdjieff about uh, higher states of consciousness, and Gurdjieff rightly, I think, answered that you can only know a higher state of consciousness by its taste. So really, it's important that people have to... to and, and a critic who's not had the experience needs to have the experience, and then, then, the, then it makes the... it will make their... Uh, arguments more more kind of interesting but they they cannot be dismissed because consciousness is fundamental and any conscious state any conscious state you can think of will be connected to chemistry so there's no there's no surprise there i guess that's the problem is that these experiences are so personal and they can't you know objectively kind of collate them and and easily you know replicate them and so on these are just you know any any scientist interested in this has to have the experience and it will be a personal experience it's fen- it's phenomenology which is the study of direct experience and there but you can you can still do science around it because roland griffiths did uh, um johns hopkins university five or six years ago did a well now of a now classic study, I suppose. He gave the psilocybin was given to healthy volunteers, and they the, the bulk of those volunteers had mystical, exper- life changing experiences. Experiences, and they rated them as being the most within the five most significant experiences of their lives. And for a, a, a significant proportion of them, it was the most spiritually significant experience they'd ever had. So, and you do that through questionnaires. I mean, there's another approach is you can scan the brain of someone having a psychedelic experience, but that's you're very far removed from the experience then. But they can give questionnaires and you can tease out common motifs and common experiences. And, you know, science can and is uh, appreciating the, the powerful effects of uh, psilocybin. Yeah. What do, what do you think is happening then when you do you know have these mystical experiences or you can't you, you sense another intelligence you know what what what's your theory about um, what is being contacted if anything? Well, I'm actually writing an essay at the moment about that very for a book of sort of academic philosophical essays that's um, being made. Um, I my I mentioned before I have a sort of Jungian approach to these things and I, my, my Terence McKenna used to call 
there's a sense that you're you're communing with a higher intelligence on when you take psilocybin. That's a, one of the that's quite a commonly reported uh, experience. Well, cer certainly a um, another intelligence to one's own that is not uh, embodied, right? Well, doesn't well, have to be. Why, why is it a higher intelligence? Well, that's just a terminology I use because it seems wise. In my, in my experience, it's like a wisdom. It gives, you, so in, it gives you insights. Yes, it's yeah, like yeah. there's an I-thou relationship there. And through things like visions and uh, intuitions and insights and such, particularly through visions, you, you, it feels like, I'm not, I can only speak for myself here, it feels like there is a, a wiser something that is showing things to you. And there's an I-thou relationship. There's you and there's this other. Terence McKenna McKenna called it the other with a big O. Um, I, my take on it is that this that is that it's the unconscious, and that psilocybin and ayahuasca and other psychedelics they they boost this potential of the unconscious to organise its informational content into uh, revelatory um, meanings, if you like, and so. It's, it's like insights bubble up from the unconscious. Uh, they're they're self-organized and they bubble up from the unconscious. Similar, I suppose, to dreams. We've all had um, instructive dreams or tutorial dreams where we wake up and think, wow, what the hell was that? You know, maybe we, we ponder on it and think, oh, I was being shown something there, you know, in a very candid way, you know, maybe a painfully candid way. I was being shown something in that dream. I think this is what the unconscious can do. The, if we listen to the unconscious, there's wisdom there. And so what psychedelics do, they boost this potential, this wise potential of the unconscious, and it becomes, it floods, those insights flood into um, into conscious awareness. So I think the other, for me, rather than, I mean, other people will say it's an alien intelligence or it's an entity from, you know, some other dimension or something, or some people will say it's God or some people will say it's, you know, Jesus and, or my hat, you know, um, or angels speaking to you or whatever. Um, I think it's the, the, un the, the unconscious will use, um, it will use whatever guise it will it will manifest to the to the experiencer in in a way that the experiencer can understand. So if you're very religious, if you're very if you're, yeah, like the as an example in I think 1961, 1962, Harvard did as part of the Harvard psilocybin project. There was this famous Good Friday ex, uh, experiment where they gave psilocybin to theology students. And they, they interpret the visions they had. They were communicating with God and Jesus. Why were they? How come they were interpreting that as God or Jesus? Because that's the nature of their psyche, the way their unconscious works and the relationship of the unconscious to the conscious. It was all in religious terminology because that's the symbology. It's like symbology has uh, local dialects, if you like, uh, connected to the, the the way a person's psyche is configured, and so I, I so yeah, to your question, what, what the the other for me, my current take, my current understanding, and you know it can change in time, but my current take on the matter is that the other is the unconscious, and I, I call it the higher self. So when you take psilocybin or ayahuasca, what you're exposed to, what manifests, is the higher self, which is you. It's really you. But it's from your your unconscious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Tony Peak has a similar sort of uh, formulation of, of that. Um, he talk, he calls it the a Adelon and the Daemon. Yes, I've so, seen uh, references yeah. to that. So the Adelon is your normal waking consciousness, and the Daemon is this higher self that you can sometimes get access to or, or communication with. Right. But it's all part of you at some level. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But when. When you're getting insights, I mean, these insights can be sort of beyond your own normal everyday programming, and they can be personal about yourself and give you insight into yourself. And that seems to come from a a wiser place from your everyday programming. And then you, there's also these other visions that people get through these um, psychedelics and uh, entheogens of sort of about your own society and, and um, the follies of your own society. And then there's a, like almost like I believe there's a, like a, 
a place beyond that that get that then gives you insights into sort of what we're doing to the planet and to nature as a whole. Do you think, therefore, if you sort of trace back, you know, the sort of um, the hierarchy of 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 these kind of insights that the or or the deepest or the highest one is is almost at some kind of planetary level or, or cosmic level. I mean, I mean, do you look at it in that in that terms in terms of the categories of of the insights and and sort of deduce from that where this intelligence resides? Is is there a case to be made for that? Well, there, there's definitely di different layers, and you can yeah. go deeper and deeper. Um, but one of the things I thought about with all this, because an, a, another thing that used to bother me, because a few times people would uh, I'd be banging on about how amazing psilocybin is. And then and I, in my psilocybin solution, it's, uh, I mentioned that the Aztecs uh, thought so, uh, regarded psilocybin as sacred. And a few times people would ask me, they were saying, well, these Aztecs, they were they, what about all this slaughter and, you know, tearing people's hearts out? How do you explain that if the priests were using psilocybin? How come they, they were not peaceful? And, and it, But I used to sort of ignore all that. I, could, I had no answer. You know, what, how can you take – but then, I've again, my naivety has gone. And, um, you know, I've, I've met people you – know, basically, if, if someone's an arsehole – temporarily they might not be an arsehole when they take psilocybin, but eventually they'll become an arsehole again. It gives you nothing permanent. But so getting back to how different people, it can affect people differently and what's actually going on. What it occurred to me recently that maybe one way of understanding what psilocybin does or what ayahuasca does, maybe it, what it does is it brings into conscious awareness um, important issues of the day, as it were that are within, that are sort of in, inherent within the unconscious, within this vast system of self-organizing information that is the unconscious. And so there's going to be some subjectivity there. So when you take ayahuasca or psilocybin, one of the first things that happens is you see your relationships and any sort of uh, unfinished business connected with your relationships comes into the fore and you have to work through problems you see where there are tensions and such with your loved ones and your friends and what have you and that they become it can become painful well but it can become therapeutic because all this stuff comes into conscious awareness that's why they have therapeutic value so that those i was saying this way of understanding those are important issues for you yeah your relationship how you stand in life socially kind of thing and the people you know the relationships you're in they become so important issues there come to the fore. Deeper than that, you get cultural issues will, will emerge because we're all, we all live in the same sort of society, the same culture. We're embedded in the same biosphere, even though people aren't, may not be overtly green and may, they, might, they might not overtly be thinking about the state of the biosphere. It's all there within the unconscious. And so the reason why they might have this eco ayahuasca and psilocybin might have an eco psychological impact now that's quite common is because within the average human the typical human psyche say deep down we know there are these ecological problems with uh, and there's something amiss with our relationship with the biosphere and so that that emerges so i think it's all about important issues of the day important unfinished business things that need to be attended to that is what becomes clear it like it gets rid of all the shit and all the useless stuff and what stands out are the important issues that's what you you're forced to confront and you're forced to think about and feel about during the psychedelic experience however our normal consciousness in many people would not give such weight to those sort of distant cultural or ecological concerns and yet no, no, when, it, it when you have this experience you feel it personally you know you can feel the sort of the whole pain of the planet and and all these kind of things which is just you know in, in people that perhaps did not have any of those tendencies in the first place yeah that that's the thing is it does does uh, that's what i'm saying that even though you might for an, an, the average human psyche might not think about these issues these global issues and our relationship to the the web of life and how we're, you know, and the, the course of human history and stuff through, through psychedelics that might, well, they might well confront all this. Now they, they might well have all these profound thoughts about themselves, the role of the, the meaning of life and what the human race should be doing. All that is more likely to, to, 
they'll be forced to confront those things. And that's why it can be a, you know, you can have a very normal, regular person who never thinks about those things. And suddenly their, their, their life is changed. And then suddenly they're, you know, um, they see things totally differently and they're, they're much more sensitive to these larger contexts within which, which we live. I just, I just wonder where, where that capacity resides, whether it's in our DNA, whether it's in our brains, it's whether, whether, whether it's external, sort of, you know, in, in the, the zero point field, perhaps, you know, I intrinsic to everything. I, I just wonder what, where that capacity suddenly comes from that wasn't there previously in the experience of these, of these plants. Well, again, I think it's to do with the unconscious and the self-organization of information. I think um, it's like the way, the way I, I think this is connected. If you think about the, the, the human body, if you cut yourself or break a bone, all the information necessary to heal that wound is within the human organism. It just needs all the right chemicals and molecules to be in the right place, given enough time, and then the body will heal itself. It's the same with our culture and with the biosphere. All the information necessary for the biosphere to be healed, in particular the relationship, our relationship with the rest of the planet, if you like, all the information necessary for healing is within the system. It's within the, the information, and we all carry that. We all carry a la, a part of that information in, inside us within the with the unconscious. I mean, you think you think say say someone's messed up and they're deeply uh, depressed or whatever. They go and have therapy. They take ayahuasca or psilocybin with a therapist. Suddenly they confront all this stuff. They, it all comes out and they, they see it all. They see all these things. It's like the unconscious wants to be whole. It wants to ha It doesn't want to have unfinished business and loose ends. And so that the, the loose ends and unfinished business, the stuff that's wrong, that's unhealthy, wants to fix itself and it will emerge through dreams and you know it'll affect your mood and stuff but you you have to con you have to to consciously kind of deal with it but the point of me saying this is that the the, the information itself wants to organize itself so all these insights and knowing paradigm changes and all this kind of thing they're somehow they're they're inherent within the there are that's a potential of the the because we because the reality process is naturally intelligent, this is what my whole thing is all about, natural intelligence, because life is a natural intelligence, because we're part of natural intelligence, then all the, everything we need is within us, if you like, you know, um, it's just finding ways to bring it all out. No, I'm, I'm getting it now, I can see what you mean, I mean, it's like, no matter what our societies install in as, as our own particular sort yeah. of mental operating system or... Yeah. Or however we might mess up our lives and our minds, and we yeah. identify with it as, oh, that's me. I, this is me. You know, we think we have sort of dominion yeah. over ourselves. Take something like, you know, as McKenna called it, a heroic dose of of mushrooms. Suddenly, this sort of natural um, intelligence kind of flexes itself and yes. tries to move back into alignment, despite. Yes. Yes. Despite your petty little mind, yes. sort of. Being like the, it's the same as the body. The body's got yeah. all the wisdom to be healthy, yeah. right? You know, but if we eat the wrong food and we don't exercise, you know, you, you're not going to be he fit and healthy. But all the information is there. It's in the genes. It's the same with your unconscious. Even if you're you're messed up and fucked up, the, deep down, the, the human psyche's got the power to to heal itself and to be whole, and you know, um, for for your essence to shine, as it were, you know. So this is what you recently talked about at the uh, the bioethics forum in the states. This is the natural intelligence paradigm. Yeah, it, it's, it's well, it's it's, it's, it's not com subtly complex, maybe, but the, yeah, the base the basic idea is that life life is an intelligence. What we call bio biology or biologic is an intelligence. I'm not arguing. It's a. I said in that talk that I was a hurt. I was really a hermeneuticist and a, a hermeneutist. A, a silo cybernetic biohermeneuticist. Dennis McKenna tried to say that the other day. <laughs> he got it wrong. He got it totally wrong. I, no, I'm, I am a silo cybernetic biohermeneuticist, you know. Um, yeah, but her hermeneutics, well. Can, really I have a, can I have a go at decoding that, that <laughs> phrase? Yeah. Does that mean that it's that someone that has. That is, uh, taken psilocybin and has then sort of used that to sort of read nature 
with yeah, those reinter- inputs? Reinter- yeah, reinterpret reinter- nature. Yeah. The whole hermeneutics is about interpretation. Uh, uh, as I said in that talk, uh, um, hermeneutics traditionally was about the interpretation of texts, like particularly religious texts, because you can always reinterpret religious texts according to the culture you're in. Um, but it's now hermeneutics is spreading out into various academic disciplines, and uh, there, there's now environmental hermeneutics, which is all about how we interpret nature. So the natural intelligence paradigm is sim- – I'm not invoking any new forces or laws or anything like that. It's a, uh, a new perspective, a new interpretation of what life, and in particularly the evolution of life, what, what they really are. And I, I'm, I make the case um, that life – that evolving that life is is a natural intelligence and that evolution is a naturally intelligent process in terms of what gets sustained the kinds of changes that biological changes and genetic changes that are preserved by nature they're always to do with uh, making sense and so um you, you, one can see life evolving life as a sense making process it's a way that the in a way that what i think Life, what I think is going on with the universe, um, and I'm talking about bigger metaphysical ideas now, that, that, that nature or the universe or the cosmos is in the, it's in the process of making sense of itself, and it does that through the vehicle of life and consciousness. Um, but, yeah, I basically argue that life is a, natural, is a naturally intelligent um, phenomenon and that we can learn from it. And, um, you know, the, the problem with... Our culture now, one of the problems is that we're divor- we have this disconnect from the larger uh, web of life that actually sustains us. The larger web of life sustains us because it provides all these ecosystem services, even though we don't acknowledge them. And um, we live in cities and we're surrounded with we've sort of our chests are thrust out so much and we're so in love that the human race has its head up its own arse so far that we're choking on our own head that's up our own ass you know um so we, we've got this disconnect with the rest of the and the but the, the the real sad thing is that 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 larger web of life all the wisdom if we want to have a sustainable tenure if we want to carry on you know seven billion people have we have to fit in with the larger web of life and to do that we have to acknowledge that the larger web of life has a wisdom to it that's been learned over millions and millions of years and there are you know, ecological principles and stuff like symbiosis and recycling and all that kind of thing and regeneration. Um, and so the, the importance of this natural intelligence paradigm, I think, or one of the, one of the important things is that uh, you, we can see that um, life is a, a, is, a, is a wisdom or intelligence and that we can learn from it. Yeah. In the, um, in the, uh, the talk that you gave there, you started um, with quotes from physicists on how the universe is – is they said there's nothing special, and it's the more that they learn about it, the more they realize it's pointless. And then you went on to say that um, in evolutionary theory, they use all these terms for e- uh, for evolution, such as dumb, mindless, blind. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, given given the the wondrous phenomena that they these scientists tend to study firsthand, why do you think they come into these conclusions? It's not all of them. I did. I did cherry pick to make. You know, you do that when you give presentations. But uh, yeah, well, I invent. I invented this word in Darwin's unfinished business called merelyism, as it as it and merelyism is, is when a someone or a scientist or someone says, "Oh, this is merely like consciousness is merely brain activity, or you know, life is merely molecules moving around in a certain way." There is a tendency for merelyism, and merelyism is is. It's very dismissive, you know. It comes from a a dull state of mind, I think, you know, um, because the you know, reality is phenomenal. You know, we are alive, we're conscious, we're we're connected to a human organism, which is fantastically complex. And there's a for con- for consciousness to exist, it has it sits on the top of a vast, huge, immense, gargantuan pyra- pyramid of natural intelligence that extends into the the whole of nature, including the laws of nature and the forces of nature. Um, so the fact, so so th- th- this consciousness that sits on the top of this vast, this massive system of natural intelligence can dismiss it all. It's like a, it's, it's a very arrogant, pompous kind of consciousness. But unfortunately, it's, I think, I think part of the problem is that we're, re- because religion 
swayed the day for so long and it called all the shots. There's been a reaction against religion now. And so you have hardcore, the pendulum has swung. So you have absolute hardcore atheism. And there is no intelligence, there is no advanced intelligence apart from our own. And, uh, you know, religion is a load of rubbish and we live in a, the, the, the universe is an accident. So the, the pendulum, that's the, pe- that's the way I see it. The pendulum has just, just swung to the, the other side, you know. So, so I think that it needs so to, that, sorry, go on, go on. Well, sorry. it needs to rest. I think it needs to come to rest and we shouldn't throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. And it, it's one thing to, to say that, 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 that there can be no kind of old fashioned God being who sits up in the sky and judges us and intervenes now and again. That it's one thing to dismiss that, but we shouldn't dismiss the notion that there's an intelligence to the reality process, and that that, and that, that intelligence is inherent in the, the the laws of nature and the forces of nature and the Lego like building blocks that the universe is is made of. So I think it's to do with this pen. There's like conceptual paradigmatic swings and we've gone from a highly we've gone from the totally everyone's religious and god you know praise the lord god did everything and we've gone to the other extreme now that there's nothing you know it's just a one massive we're sort of w- walking around shuffling our feet in a massive accident within an even bigger accident with even within an even bigger accident you know i think that's the pendulum going to the other extreme so what, so what are you trying to do by introducing this natural intelligence paradigm and, and how is that different to a creator and, and, and how, does, how does your view differ from uh, con- conventional views of evolution as well? well I, I have no friends. It's this, this is the thing. It's between a rock and a hard place because, because it's not – you've got religious people, the intelligent design uh, movement, which say God did it all, that certain things in life – couldn't have evolved and so there must be some supernatural thing stepping in you know it's god in other words the creation is so they won't like the natural intelligence paradigm you've got hardcore um neo-darwinian dogma that that will won't like what i'm saying because i'm reinterpreting if all evolution as a naturally intelligent process they don't like it so i'm i'm sort of off off <laughs> off on my own really it's a re- it's a tough position to be in but um i I think it's it's the only tenable the only tenable position and it's it argues that see a lot of people when when they hear this when they hear these ideas they think i'm talking about vitalism or the the idea that the intelligence is outside of the system outside of nature i'm saying that that nature is an intelligence that evolving life is and intelligence, um, and so it's quite. A, it's kind of. It's a. It's, it is a reinterpretation. It's not a complex reinterpretation, but it's quite hard to get. I think, and you have to. In order to get it, you have to understand that intelligence is a process. It's a verb. That's a very important to realise that intelligence is a verb, not a, not a thing. It's a ver- You know, reality is made of verbs. We have nouns. That's a linguistic con- a conceptual convenience we invented nouns but a noun is a cross section through a, for a process there are only processes um, so once you realize that intelligence is a process or a verb there's no reason why it has to be tied to the mind um, and I, I see life itself biologic patterns of uh, molecular and chemical uh, activity that that is an intelligence, but it's unconscious. I'm arguing that life is an unconscious intelligence that's becoming conscious. So that's, there are a number of hurdles I have to get over, or an audience needs to get over before they can take on board the natural intelligence paradigm. They have to see that intelligence is a process for for starters, uh, and they have to see that intelligence can be unconscious. So when I when I say that life is an intelligence. I mean, it's an unconscious intelligence. So when you, when you look down at a cell in a microscope and you look at all the, the DNA and the way the DNA is being transcribed and you see all these complex, exquisite, sophisticated uh, biomolecular processes, that's, for me, that's an unconscious intelligence that, that you're perceiving. Uh, and that this this intelligence that is life is becoming once it's created a cortex and it's done all this groundwork, 
then I think conscious intelligence emerges, which is a, which is a new expression of previous systems of, of intelligence. So, so, so conscious intelligence that we enjoy, it gets back to this pyramid of natural intelligence again. There's a pyramid of unconscious natural intelligence that conscious human intelligence sits on the top of. And, I, and if you then ask me, well, where did this system of unconscious intelligence come from? I think it, if you go back far enough, it was conscious intelligence again. I think, it, I think there's, this intelligence goes through these cosmic periods of unconsciousness and consciousness, like those Hindu notions. So something is waking up. I'm saying the whole, what the universe is doing over time is is wake, waking up and re, regenerating itself and rebuilding itself and so also, that it becomes conscious again and also projecting into the future going back to sleep again I, yeah it probably goes in cycles yeah it becomes it's one and then it, it's like you know the terminator you know the terminator 2 movie you know yeah. the bad terminator yeah it could go yeah, into yeah, all yeah. those pieces and it would always join back together again yeah i think something like that is happening that this yeah. this conscious intelligence or will disintegrates itself and rebuilds yeah. itself. Well, Alan, this is, what, Alan, this what, is uh, religious territory here in a way, isn't it? This is like uh, Vedantist Hinduism says the same thing. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I'm attracted to Hindu ideas and they're, they're, some of their notions. It's all very symbolic. and but so, Some of their notions, and they're very almost like the components of a story. And I, and I often think, you know, Terence McKenna used to say the used to say that um, the universe was made of language. And I think it, it's like a story, you know, it's a self, a big story. And um, there are all these, yeah, a lot of the Hindu ideas, the Hindu sort of myths, um, yeah, they resonate with me. I quite like those notions, you know. But in dealing with such ideas, you're going to be having a, a difficult time with the, uh, the mainstream uh, uh, biologists and physicists, I guess, just a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's, it's again, it's inter, inter, it's interpretation. You know, you say potato, I say chips. You know, it's different interpretations, and um, you know, ultimately, we all live in the, the same universe, and the universe is fantastic. So, you know, you, you can either say it's 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 simply this process, or you can reinterpret and say something. There's something deeper going on. You know. So I'm, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be. I've always been interested in the nature of reality, and I've always, you know, I, I can lay my cards on the table and say that I, I've always had an overwhelming suspicion that, as Paul Davies would say, the, the writer Paul Davies, um, he, he always felt there was when you look at the universe, when you look at the laws of nature, if, if you look at the forces of nature and the laws of nature, and you, you look at what the universe is capable of doing like giving birth to life and consciousness. Um, you know, it just seems r too good to be true. And you think, particularly consciousness, that we, we're conscious, we can consciously enjoy being, you know. Um, when you look at all that, Paul Davies used to say he felt there was something going on. He didn't say what was going on, you know, it's just a very, it's just like a very basic, you know, hang on a minute, there's, there's something going on. I've always, I share that and I always have. I think there's good re it's not you're not mad to think there's something going on it's no more fantastic to say there's something going on than there is to say it's all a big accident you know it all just came from nothing for no reason you know um so I've always had that suspicion that there's something going on and you know religion conventional religion never seemed to provide any more answers and I, so I, you know I pursued the whole psilocybin thing because it that plunges you directly into the plugs you directly into the mystery, I think. And, um, you know, I try not to be a sensationalist and stuff. And I think it's what I, the stuff I write about and talk about is fairly reasonable. You know, it's not too, too it, it, at the end of the day, it's a, a different interpretation of things. No, and it seems like, um, it seems like the story is, is building and, and the message is getting out there in many different ways. I mean, I mean, this, they're starting to study psilocybin a bit more again now, aren't they? And, uh, yeah. and DMT and so on, and, yeah, and yeah. using psilocybin therapeutically again. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you, you, go on, sorry. 
No, no, I was saying it's making its way. Uh, there's two there's two scientific organisations, MAPS and the Hefter Research Institute, and they, they're doing a lot of – there's more research going on now with psilocybin, LSD, and uh, ayahuasca, and um, MDMA as well, uh, MDMA. Um, there's more research going on now than there, there was like 20 years ago. So, um, yeah, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's there. You know, you, you see it on social media and stuff. Um, I know there, there's always been an interest in these, these kind of things. So, and there always will be an interest in these. Someone once said, I think it was Freeman Pierce, Dyson suggested that the universe was, a, was deliberate. It's an intentional universe is what I'm saying. Life and consciousness are functions of the universe. The laws are the way they are, the forces of nature are the way they are, for a reason. Life falls into place, the genetic code falls into place, evolution happens because it has to happen. What I'm saying is that nature is a naturally intelligent system in terms of the way it's configured. Nature is the intelligence. I'm not saying there's an intelligence outside of nature. I'm saying nature is the intelligence. And consciousness is the way that this intelligence wakes up to itself. Consciousness is the vehicle through which nature wakes up to itself and knows itself and comes to know its own potential.